thing. I think we have a different uh, time zone throughout this uh, webinar. A very warm welcome to all of you to this mobility webinar, which is focusing on internationalization and the Caribbean. This webinar is co-founded by the European Commission and is done in collaboration with HowlRound for the web streaming. The webinar is also held in collaboration with the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States and the program ACP EU that is also co-funded by the European Union. Before we start this webinar, I may have a few technical rules to share with you. Uh, throughout the webinar, we kindly request that you keep your camera on off and your sound off for the entirety of the talk. Basically, we will have a focus only on the guest and after on the panel, uh, on the panelists for the panel discussion. So thank you very much for that, so that it can allow also to have a nice sound environment to hear everybody. And of course, you will have the opportunity as a participant to share your question and your comment uh, in the chat um, throughout the webinar. The webinar will be held in English as the majority of people who register for this webinar chose English as their language. But of course, as it was planned, there is also interpretation in Spanish. You can activate the interpretation uh, with the bottom at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so you can choose English, EN or Spanish, uh, ES depending on the choice of your language. I may take the oppor this opportunity to thank very much our two interpreters, Mariam Shahid Babu and Belen Simaro. Last but not least, we also have caption, and these captions are provided both in English and in Spanish, of course, through the National Captioning Institute. Please, uh, we uh, encourage you not to activate the IA function at the bottom of your screen, but to follow uh, the two captioning links, so either in English or in Spanish, that my uh, colleague Bernardo is sharing in the chat, so that you can have also like better uh, captioning. So for the English captioning, the two captioners are Miranda Garcia and Ronda Chiqueral. So thank you very much for them. Once again, a very warm welcome to this webinar on internationalization and the Caribbean. My name is Marie Le Sour, and I am the Secretary General of On The Move, which is the host for this webinar. For people with visual impairment, I am a woman in my very late 40, I would say, with brown hair, blue eyes, I am of white complexion, and I am wearing a black top. Two of my colleagues are also helping me for this webinar. Uh, there is Johan Flock, Director of Operation, that will collect all your questions and comment in the chat, in Spanish or in English. And there is also my colleague Bernardo Queros, who is dealing more with the technical aspect of this uh, webinar and also like sharing some content information in the chat. Before we delve into the panel discussion with our four panelists, this is my great pleasure to welcome two uh, guests. And the first of uh, these two guests, these two uh, women the guests, is Ambassador Simone Beton Nayo, who is the Jamaica Ambassador to Belgium and the Head of Mission to the European Union. Mrs. Ambassador, the floor is now to you for your welcoming notes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madame Marie Le Sorc, Secretary General of On The Move. And I'd like to recognize uh, Miss Anika Florin, Deputy Head of Unit uh, for Youth, Education and Culture at the European Commission's Directorate General for International Partnerships. I'm very pleased to provide welcome remarks at this important mobility webinar entitled internationalization and the Caribbean organized by On The Move with the support of the OECPS, Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States and the European Union in collaboration with the ACP EU culture program. The ACP, the OACPS rather, is currently the largest transcontinental intergovernmental organization representing the global South. It comprises 79 member states spanning six regions, four sub-regions in Africa, 
the Caribbean and the Pacific. OACPS states have a very rich and diverse cultural heritage, which the organization is seeking to not only safeguard, but to also promote. Cultural mobility is, an, is very important for the OACPS because there's a recognition that it can promote cultural diversity, cultural inclusion, and intercultural dialogue and exchanges, including among the youth. These initiatives can also contribute to a better understanding of societal differences, promote tolerance, and encourage peace and security. These are also very important considerations, particularly at this juncture, where the global community is grappling with political tensions and conflicts in several regions, as well as the effects of recent multifaceted external shocks. The world is undergoing profound changes and it is our duty to prepare to meet the associated challenges. Culture will undoubtedly, will undoubtedly contribute to our collective efforts. At their last summit held in Angola in December, 2022, OACPS leaders reaffirmed the importance of culture for development. For the way CPS, this is a central and cross-cutting theme, which we continue to address through inclusive approaches and through our various development initiatives, including with the EU. The OACPS's relationship with the EU spans almost five decades, and culture has historically been an important plank of ACP-EU relations. In the current partnership agreement between the OACPS and the EU, the Samoa Agreement is called the Samoa Agreement, which was signed in November 2023 and which is being provisionally applied. There are important provisions on culture, including a commitment by all parties to integrate cultural perspectives into their development policies and strategies. The Caribbean Regional Protocol, which is a component of the Samoa Agreement, also includes an article on culture and creative industries in which the parties have committed to, among other things, enhance the mobility of cultural and creative professionals. The CARI Forum EU Economic Partnership, Partnership Agreement, the reciprocal trade agreement between CARI Forum states and the EU also includes a cultural cooperation protocol. So there already exists a strong bioregional framework, which we need to fully leverage to enhance OACPS or Caribbean EU cultural cooperation. We therefore commend the ACPEU Culture Program for its various initiatives in this regard. The partnership between the program and On the Move has been fruitful and has resulted in the production of what is now the very first cultural mobility funding guide focused on the Caribbean. We welcome the outcome of this work. We are very encouraged by the work undertaken, which will no doubt contribute to ongoing efforts to enhance the cultural mobility of Caribbean cultural practitioners and professionals whose livelihoods depend on their ability to move, to ply their trade, and to explore opportunities for partnerships. I wish you a very productive webinar, and I hope that the guide and the outcome of today's event will strengthen policy responses within the Caribbean in support of the mobility of Caribbean cultural operators and will pave the way for new collaborations on this very important subject. I thank you very much and best wishes. Thank you very, very much for your opening note, uh, dear uh, Ambassador Betan uh, Nayo, that already uh, paved the way to some point of the conversation that we will have in the panel discussion and also like to remind us also of the policy uh, framework in particular, in particular in relation with the Caribbean country and the EU uh, for the matter. Um, in connection, of course, uh, with the European uh, Commission, this is uh, now my great pleasure uh, to welcome Ms. Annika Florent, oh. who is the Deputy Head of Unit uh, for Youth, Education and Culture at the Directorate General uh, for International uh, Partnerships, so DG, uh, in part at the European Commission. So, Annika, you can uh, switch on your sound and your video and the floor is yours uh, for your opening notes. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm not actually able to um, put the video on, but maybe it's something that you can do. Um, uh, we will see whether we can also activate it with my colleague. Um, uh, 
Bernardo. Uh, there is a, a button video at the... Yes, that, that now is I think it works. Ah, now it works. Perfect. <laughs> the floor is yours. Um, yes, thank Florent. you very much. Uh, and uh, good morning to, to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here from the European Commission to, to open this uh, webinar along the side of Her Excellency Simone Betonayu uh, that so forcefully uh, recalled the importance of culture uh, in the partnership uh, between the EU and the Organization for uh, the Caribbean and Pacific Group of African Caribbean and Pacific Group of States and uh, uh, the, the partnership we have with the, with the Caribbean, uh, where culture is really one of the, the core uh, pillars of our relationship. So it's an honor to uh, be here to open this important uh, seminar on the topic of international artistic and cultural mobility in the Caribbean region. Um, and we know the ability of artists and cultural professionals to move across borders is essential for, for many, many reasons. And just to give uh, uh, a, a few of them, it, it opens up borders, it opens up uh, broader career opportunities, it expands audiences and markets, uh, it creates jobs in the culture and creative sectors and related sectors, and fosters uh, cultural exchange and intercultural dialogue. And this is particularly true for, for the Caribbean, a region which is known for its rich cultural diversity and vibrant artistic expressions. The European Commission is working to improve opportunities for mobility uh, by offering funding and also by providing comprehensive and easily accessible information, both in Europe and in our partner countries. In addition to the EU flagship Creative Europe program that is mainly supporting culture and, and creative cooperation and mobility in Europe, the EU is contributing to international exchanges with partner countries through key programs like the ACPU Culture Program and Transcultura, uh, that is a, a special initiative for the Caribbean region. And these programs provide training uh, grants uh, capacity building workshops are organized, uh, networking opportunities are offered, and we're helping artists to overcome barriers to international mobility. And the overall aim is really to empower artists to enhance their skills, uh, build international partnerships, and to access new uh, markets. However, mobility in the Caribbean is often challenged by structural limitations. Uh, there's a lack of information and also lack of equal opportunity when it comes to benefiting from prospects, both within the region and in connection uh, with, with Europe. So to address this, we are proud that the ACPU Culture Programme has supported the translation of the Caribbean Mobility Guidelines into Spanish, making information on funding opportunities and cross-border cultural activities, residences and other collaborations more accessible. And we are really looking forward to hearing today's discussion and exploring how we can further strengthen cross-border cultural relations, how we can enhance access to information on opportunities and support professional development in the Caribbean. So thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you very much uh, once again to you, uh, Miss Annika Florent, for your introductory uh, notes. And here, like for Ambassador uh, Beton Nayo, I think there are also like some key points already related to the uh, opportunities that can be provided by the mobility of artists and cultural professionals, but also some specific challenge related to the Caribbean region that you highlighted that will definitely be addressed uh, in this panel discussion. Uh, without further ado, uh, I am now asking my uh, four colleagues, four panelists uh, to join me. Uh, Jordi Balta Portoles, uh, Jake Neuberger, uh, Magdalena Moreno Morica, and Anna Maria Hernandez. So that, you know, I feel less alone on this screen and that we have also like this uh, round table uh, uh, setting. Um, I may um, first uh, recall, I mean, it was said uh, during the, the, the introduction, very well said uh, by our two guest uh, speakers, but this webinar is very much linked 
to the launch of the Cultural Mobility Funding Guide focus on the Caribbean region. I would like to uh, remind, I know that maybe uh, some of you in the room already know this Mobility Funding Guide because this is the first related uh, to the Caribbean region, but there are many more that do exist. We have more than 60 Cultural Mobility Funding Guides that are available on our website, and this is from far the part of the website that is the most popular. Um, I would like just to re-highlight some key features of this mobility funding guide. These are somehow a bit technical features, but at the same time, some of these points will reconnect part of our panel discussion a bit later. First, there is always a geographical focus in relation with uh, this uh, mobility funding guide. Uh, one, I mean, the geographic focus can be on the country, usually it's like this, but more and more we have guides like the one for the Caribbean region, like the one on the South Mediterranean region uh, one year ago, uh, and these guides are co-funded by the European Union that have more a country or a territories type of multi-country or multi-territories type of focus that is not uh, you know, necessarily connected to some political or, uh, I would say, economic organization, but that are more focusing on a particular uh, geography. And just to give you an, an idea as well, this is part of a process. So in our next plan, we plan as well uh, to uh, produce a cultural mobility funding guide focus or updated also in relation with Latin America. These mobility funding guides focus first and foremost, which is a key challenge for the researcher, on regular mobility funding scheme, uh, meaning that uh, calls that are very important also, like linked to a particular cultural season, a particular year of exchange, will not be included in that kind of guide, but we focus more on mobility funding schemes that are regular, provided by public or private funder at various levels of competency, be it local, national, uh, regional, international, and European. We are focusing as well on funded mobility scheme, meaning cross-border mobility, and meaning that we will only put uh, also through uh, the great work of our researcher, mobility funding scheme that um, uh, encompass, for instance, the cost for the travel, accommodation, visa issues, so all the costs related to mobility across border. Last but not least, and this is also a key challenge depending on the world region or the country on which we focus, we focus also on online mobility opportunities. So that means that referring to calls and opportunities that are available on a regular basis on a website. This is also to facilitate this access to information. Uh, in a conclusion, uh, I would say that this guide have started to be developed um, uh, for more than um, uh, 12 or 13 years now. Um, and they are, of course, useful to the sector. I mean, we can see it with the number of downloads. It's more than 10,000 downloads every year on the website. But they became also, they have become as well more and more useful at a policy level for policymakers, for funder, in order to identify gaps of funding opportunities in a particular territory or region, and also to find interesting initiative or eventual partner with which they could also develop new mobility funding schemes. So this is also something that has uh, been more, uh, I would say, on the increase. Um, before I give the floor to uh, my um, uh, panelists and that I introduce them, I would like also to name the contributor and the researcher uh, for this cultural mobility funding guide, because once again, it's a huge work. Um, so I would like to name uh, Jordi Balta Portoles, uh, Rose Bieler, and uh, together with Jake Neuberger, from Artist at Risk Connection, which is also an On The Move member. We had also Pascal Jomé. Uh, we had Judith van der Kooy uh, that worked for Dutch Culture, which is also a key partner of On The Move, a key member of On The Move, and Stephanie Thomas Gilbert Roberts. And on the side of On The Move, we had Katie Kerji Watts, and of course, uh, Johan Flock, also in charge of the full editing and the coordination. Um, so now we are going to start in connection with the learning of this uh, cultural mobility funding guide, our uh, conversation. 
And the conversation with our four panelists will have basically two rounds and two rounds that correspond to the objective of this webinar. The first round will be more reaction from two researchers of the guide and two external guests in relation with the learning of the cultural mobility funding guide. And the second part will be more on key initiative, innovative solution that can help to strengthen mobility opportunities and support within the Caribbean region and in connection to the Caribbean region. And last but not least, we will go further towards recommendation, towards the cultural sector, and also uh, towards policymaker at various level of competency in relation to mobility information access, in relation to strengthening mobility opportunities, also in relation with uh, adapted professional development program. Uh, without uh, further ado, I will start my round of panelists. And just as a little reminder, only the panelists uh, are uh, able to have their video on so that we can really focus on them. Uh, so first of all, I would like to ask one of our key researchers for this uh, uh, mapping, so Jordi uh, Balta Portoles. Um, Jordi, I mean, um, your uh, biography will be shared in the in the chat by uh, my colleague Bernardo. Uh, you are, uh, I mean, many people uh, know you. Uh, you are also uh, you are a cultural uh, researcher, analyst. Um, but what? One thing I would like to add as well, beyond uh, the biography that is uh, shared in the chat, and now you are a bit afraid of what I am going to say, but <laughs> you were part of the first team back in 2011, 2012, that worked on the first cultural mobility funding guide that at that time was focusing on Europe. So we could see the evolution of this guide, how they've been expanded, how they have been uh, you know, evolve in terms of format as well. But we can also see that the need of accessing information is still very much there. Um, so you were in charge in this particular cultural mobility funding guide focus on the Caribbean. You were in charge of different sections. And one of these sections was more on in identifying funding sources, but more at an international regional level, including European level, for the Caribbean region. And I would like you uh, maybe to share, after also your visual uh, description of yourself, maybe to share also um, some of the key learning that you have also when you compare the level of opportunities for the region with other world region with whom you have been working. Because I think there are also like some specificity that you can highlight in relation with the Caribbean region. Thank you very much, Jordi. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marie, and good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone. Yes, indeed, as, as you were saying, we've been around for for, for a while. Uh, just uh, for my, my visual description is I'm a, I'm a white man in my late 40s. I have uh, dark graying hair and today I'm wearing a maroon polo and I wear glasses as well. Um, now going to to your question, yes, indeed. I mean, I think uh, one of the one of the things that people will find in the guide, and and particularly if we compare it with what we found in other similar guides, including in particular those with a with a regional uh, scope, uh, is the fact that uh, probably there's less uh, funding opportunities that have a very concrete national or territorial focus when you compare it to to other places and 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 i would guess that this might partly be due to the relatively small uh, size of some of the territories being covered and it might also have to do at least in some cases for instance when we think of countries that are archipelagos or uh, countries or territories that are historically connected to uh, nation states with the fact that other kinds of mobility uh, often take prevalence so that let's say in internal mobility within the national uh, um, archipelago the national island structure or mobility to the home territories often takes precedence over uh, international mobility having said this what we also find and i think that's worth stressing is uh, a, a significant section of international mobility funding opportunities. Say so that is generally the kinds of calls or uh, grant programs and, and schemes that are meant 
generally for artists or cultural professionals from countries in the global south or available to anyone of whatever nationality. And, and so there's many of those opportunities that would be valid for the Caribbean as they are valid for uh, other, other regions. Uh, Often what we find is, in this case, opportunities that are established by development agencies or by arts councils in the global north or uh, some international residencies. And often these are meant to support the attendance of events, capacity building, short-term exploration grants, uh, and so on. Now, of course, because these, are, these have a very broad geographic scope, it also means that artists and culture professionals from the Caribbean will be in direct competition with candidates from uh, many other uh, regions. The other thing that we find is a significant number of opportunities that have uh, either, uh, uh, that have a scope that is determined by linguistic areas, such as the Spanish-speaking uh, regions or the French-speaking uh, areas uh, and so on, or which are connected to uh, historical links or uh, national links. And what this also shows, and of course it's not a surprise, is that the relationships with the former metropolises of many of the countries and territories covered by the guide remain uh, very important. Uh, so this is, these are some of the trends we observe. Now, what this also shows is that there are relatively few programs that take the Caribbean region as a whole. There are some, uh, I mean, the, 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 the work that has historically been done by the EU ACP uh, uh, programs uh, is worth uh, mentioning. The Transcultura program of the EU and UNESCO is uh, worth mentioning as well. Uh, there's initiatives like the Caribbean Mobility Fund from the uh, Institut Francais, which has historically been important, even though some of these schemes are not active uh, at present, but they might uh, come back. But uh, let's say there's relatively, there's some opportunities addressed to the Caribbean as a whole, but when you compare it to other regions, there's probably less. The last point is that probably we find less opportunities meant for incoming mobility towards the Caribbean than opportunities that are meant for outgoing uh, mobility. And of course, that means that there's some opportunities for artists and cultural professionals from the Caribbean to travel abroad, but probably less for uh, audiences uh, or for artistic communities in the Caribbean to receive or host or welcome and, and exchange in their own territories with uh, uh, foreign uh, professionals. So I think that's that's it for the first round. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, uh, Jordi, uh, for this key point and also with this comparison with uh, all the rural regions that were covered in past uh, cultural mobility funding guide. I will turn now, I mean, it's always weird with the visual thing, but it's on also in the same side, uh, with, uh, towards Jake. Uh, Jake uh, Neuberger, you are uh, the program coordinator for Latin America and the Caribbean at Artist at Risk Connection, which is a member of On the Move. Uh, your organization were in particular um, in relation with artists in exile and persecuted uh, artists and cultural professionals. So your role here together with your uh, uh, colleague Rose was more uh, to work on the section related to the US uh, territories and the mapping of funding uh, opportunities with regard to mobility. So the Navassa Island, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Island. Um, I think it would be quite interesting, as you did in the introduction, but maybe to delve more into that, to share about your, I would say, your mapping and research strategy in order to make more visible some mobility opportunities for which people from, I mean, artists, cultural professionals from these territories can apply, but sometimes do not feel legitimate to apply because the name of their territory is not clearly indicated. So maybe you can more uh, develop about this fact and other points that you follow in your research process. Thank you very much, Jake. Thank you so much, Marie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just do a quick self-presentation for any visually impaired folks with us today. Uh, I'm a white man in my mid-20s with brown short hair and brown facial hair, and I'm wearing a collared gray shirt. Um, as Marie mentioned, I had the pleasure of working on the U.S. section of this guide, along with my colleague Rose, who's in the chat with us today. 
And uh, I wanted to share a couple of challenges, as she mentioned, regarding the different mapping um, and the, the challenges we see, particularly for U.S. territories, in this case, really the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Uh, and I think they can broadly be understood in three buckets, and I think they align very much with uh, Jordi's findings related to kind of this idea of visibility, sustainability, and inclusivity. Um, so the visibility component of this and the challenges that we saw in mapping was this kind of idea of naming, right? Uh, a lot of individuals, in this case particularly, uh, individuals from Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands are U.S. citizens, and they are open and allowed to apply for the same opportunities that any U.S. artist in the in the continental U.S. would have. Uh, but they're not always named in these guides. And in, in fact, it was a challenge for us at the beginning when researching to find which uh, programs were specifically allowing artists from U.S. territories or not. Um, so that is a really big challenge, we note. And, and that's why this guide, I think, is so crucial, because it is also helping to shed light on these opportunities for these artists. Uh, of course, more needs to be done with institutions and the groups that have these calls to you know, make these uh, individuals and communities feel included in them. But that is a really important point. Um, I would also highlight the idea of sustainability and something that Marie mentioned at the very beginning with the guide is that uh, we unfortunately couldn't include some really interesting local opportunities given uh, a certain instability or uncertainty related to the sustainability of these programs, uh, especially in the context of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands following 2017 or 2018 with Hurricane Maria and other natural disasters. We did see an increase in funding, uh, mostly, though, focused on recovery and, and development in the short term. And while that was great and a really important effort, uh, we see now, you know, a couple of years removed that a lot of those programs had to change scope or are no longer easily confirmable as being active programs. Um, so that's another real challenge that we see is waves of funding, perhaps related to recovery or some form of resilience that don't actually help build up the infrastructure for long term mobility. Uh, and the final point I would say is inclusivity, which kind of ties back to this idea of, of visibility, but it's making these individuals feel like there is a voice in the room with these opportunities that is promoting and, and helping them feel like they are a part of this process. Um, in the specific context of the United States, there are regional arts federations and councils that work for a grouping of states in, in collective to help promote opportunities and work of artists from those states. We don't see the same kind of federation or association specifically for territories in the U.S. nor uh, Caribbean territories of the U.S. And that is something that I think also could perhaps make folks feel a bit disillusioned and is also challenging uh, for mapping. And of course, you know, speaking within the context of the U.S. versus the EU, there are some schemes we see at the regional level that involve nations or territories related to, to the European Union that uh, Puerto Rican or U.S. Virgin Island artists will not be eligible for. Uh, so that's another challenge to keep in mind and how we can foment, uh, you know, greater opportunities specifically within the Caribbean region for artists that I think would also then help to diminish a bit this competition level that that Jordi was alluding to. So those would just be a quick few insights. Thank you very much. I mean, we can see um, how there are some connection between the, the feedback, but also like some specificity in relation with the, with the territory um, that were in focus for the research and the mapping. I am now turning myself towards uh, Ana Maria Hernandez. Uh, Ana Maria, you are the founder and the director of the platform Aruba based in uh, Aruba. Um, so here now also with you and later with Magdalena, we are not asking the researcher, but external partner to react on the learning uh, of, the, of the guide. And I guess your eyes were maybe more going toward the Dutch Caribbean uh, island and territory. And, and so this part was particularly uh, done by uh, Judith van den Koyf and Dutch culture. So there was really a deep research done into this uh, respect. Um, and, and maybe to connect to some of your comments that you may have and how what you read resonate with what you experience also in Aruba and, and, and the other uh, Caribbean island. Maybe there is a word I would like to add to the one uh, of Jake. Uh, he talked about visibility, sustainability, inclusivity. And when we prepare uh, the session, you talk about the diversity as well. I mean, we have this, the Caribbean or even the Caribbean island of the kingdom of the Netherlands. And there is a great diversity between uh, you know, Bonaire and uh, Aruba, St. Martins and the different islands. So maybe you want to react on that and to see to what extent mobility funding scheme, when they exist or not, are really, you know, tackling the issue of this diversity of context as well. Thank you, Ana Maria. 
Thank you so much, Marie, for the introduction. Uh, very quick, my uh, description. I am a woman in my mid-30s, uh, long, dark hair, white complexion, and I'm wearing a white blouse. Um, indeed, I uh, am the founder of Plataforma Aruba, and when we started with Plataforma Aruba, the idea was to really bring another um, perspective of what art education is, um, because here I saw that there are a lot of uh, focus on the production and how to make art, but not what do we do with what we're making and how we see it. Um, and maybe to put it in context for, for this uh, topic of diversity and all of the topics that uh, Jake brought forward, um, when I started, of course, the first hurdle is to understand that you're a new foundation or new organization, so you cannot expect to get funding um, without any kind of proof. So I knew I had to invest in those for first years. Um, and I had experience already working and living in, um, in Holland in the cultural sector, so I already knew funding um, as a principle. But uh, what I've been finding out lately, which is shocking to be shocked by it, is that not a lot of artists or organizations know what funding is possible and how to get access to it. And it comes because of what we've mentioned before, like what is the visibility of these open calls um, in terms of accessibility, for us, the term open call is super normal and, and, and very, we know what it is, but for a lot of people, it's very confusing. Um, so they might see a post or they might hear about it, but they don't understand that it's a possibility for or, or an opportunity for them to uh, execute a project. Um, talking about the diversity uh, component uh, that I was talking to you earlier, it's very funny to see how Yes, we don't talk about the Caribbean sometimes so explicitly, but even when we do, it's talked about in such a broad manner and there are so many Caribbeans. And as you just said, even the Dutch Caribbean within the islands, how I experience uh, the cultural sector in Aruba and in Curaçao is, is very different than Bonaire, especially St. Martin Saba and St. Eustatius because the infrastructures are very different. So for example, if you have an open call for the Dutch Caribbean, um, me as a cultural practitioner, it's I'm gonna face very different challenges to access this open call or this funding than somebody in St. Martin. Just for example, with the Chamber of Commerce, the system or the time that it takes to set up uh, everything in the Chamber of Commerce is extremely different. And also the access to information, I remember when I first arrived just to get information on how to open a foundation here, I couldn't find it anywhere. So a lot of cultural practitioners, they don't have access to that information. And then when they have access to the open call, they don't have the infrastructure to actually receive it. Um, so I think that's also something that I don't know how it can be tackled, but it's something that I think we should be more aware of um, in terms of, yes, if you want to make it accessible, it really takes for us to go a bit further and really see the nuances, uh, not only, let's see, let's say like regional within the Caribbean, but also island per island or country by country. I think that's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, feedback. Uh, and I am finishing the, the first round of feedback in relation with the learning uh, of the guide uh, with uh, Magdalena moreno Morica. So first of all, I would like to thank Magdalena a lot because I say at the beginning of the webinar that we are in very different time zone here. <laughs> But Magdalena is based in Australia, so it's even more a challenge. So thanks a lot, because for you, it's very late at night, almost the morning of the next day. You are the director of the executive director of IFACA, which is the International Federation of Art Council and Cultural Agency. Uh, as for the other uh, speaker, your bio is being shared uh, in the chat. It was in the program. I would like to highlight that you are also a member of the UNESCO Expert Facility group to support the implementation of the 2005 UNESCO uh, Convention on Diversity. And, and it have also, I mean, this mention has also a connection with one of the questions I would like to, to ask you. Um, my question also in relation to your feedback is like, to what extent what you read in the guide, uh, particularly like the introduction uh, notes of each of the section, the feedback that you hear now resonate with some of the discussion that you have more at the policy level with your 
a member at the level of IFACA, but also in particular with the Caribbean region, and to what extent as well it connects to uh, this um, the specificity around the south to south mobility and the feeling of uh, disconnection, isolation, lack of connectivity that many artists and cultural professionals are facing. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Anna Maria was also mentioning this, like, well, uh, it's also the question of knowing what the where the funding is, what the funding is for. So maybe you would like to share some key uh, idea that you have in connection with your work uh, at IFACA and also in relation with UNESCO. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, and thank you for this opportunity. I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming from the Boiwaroi Woiwaroi land of the East Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present that is in Melbourne. Um, for the my visual description, I am a Latin American woman in my early 50s with short brown curly hair and olive skin. I'm wearing a green jacket and a white and blue top, striped top. Um, indeed, uh, I also want to thank you, uh, Marie, and I also want to acknowledge OECPS, who are also members of IFICA, and I also want to acknowledge the European Commission for the great work that they do. Um, tremendous synergies with what is happening uh, globally and definitely what is happening with our uh, members as well. These are recurring issues um, that our members, which are government agencies, funding agencies, arts councils and ministries really face. And I just want to touch on a few of those. Um, definitely the situation of sovereignty and um, the, and territories and um nations that are uh, uh, within a broader sovereign context um, definitely have an impact. Um, the I ICP, which is the Institute for Puerto Rican Culture, is a member of IFICA, and I know that it is a, something that is a very important to them in terms of how they connect, particularly uh, with their Latin American colleagues, um, and so there are uh, some uh, challenges there. Um, it also resonates strongly with the situation in the Pacific. And again, those countries are sovereign and then territories are non also face that challenge. Um, the flow within the region is a very, very big challenge. And we also see this in our colleagues in, in Africa, the ability to get to and from for that mobility and that flow of exchange within the South, South and within the region quite often has to go through, in certain cases, even through the global north or in remote or non, you know, extra regional um, uh, uh, um, destinations, which are costly and also are creating barriers with that sort of ongoing. And um, that is definitely a very, very big issue in the global south uh, in, in, in terms of all broadly south-south exchange. And we also see that with our colleagues in the Caribbean. Um, challenges in the administrative processes, particularly when it comes to international funding, we're seeing members, our members, many of our members that are very keen to support uh, um, projects and mobility uh, in the Caribbean and in other parts of the global south. If the if the organisation that isn't, isn't applying doesn't have a particular makeup that can fit within their local um, legal parameters that can be quite strict. It's incredibly like you have to be legally uh, incorporated and that can be incredibly challenging. And it also creates a limitation in terms of who can apply. Uh, challenges, one particular challenge is on budgets and where to allocate money these days, particularly post COVID. So we had the stimulus packages that were obviously greatly welcomed stimulated a lot of different opportunities and creative expressions, particularly and exchanges um, online or, you know, just uh, enabled a bit more flexibility. And we saw our members quite innovative in how resilient and, and sort of responsive they were to the environment, um, even breaking down some of the more rigid structures of what funding criteria and reporting would look like. However, they are also in the situation of budget cuts, um, uh, all that spending of government, central government, is now seeing a decline and we're seeing budgets drop. Then there's also the pressure within the, in, in the country, if we're speaking of international uh, 
support from the global north, particularly the expectation of why should money go elsewhere when we need it within country, when then the issues within country. And um, the reality is that it's needed everywhere. So it's um, so that is a, a very big challenge. And I guess there I also really commend the Nordic Culture Fund, which the conglomerate of, of the arts councils and the ministries of culture in the Nordic region with their Globus program, because they've recognized that and they've made a, quite an intentional sort of take on it to make sure that that compensates. Um, issues of reciprocity, and I know that this comes up in, I know the FAIR charter that, um, uh, uh, FAIR culture uh, charter that geordie has been involved in can maybe talk more about that, but that fairness in that exchange continues to be a challenge. Um, the multilingual, the lack of information has already been said. And I also want to draw the attention to the climate crisis because while if you've got a region that can be connected by land, then that's great that you can address some of the climate sort of uh, uh, issues uh, around uh, flying. But when you're a region of islands, archipelagos, when you're when you're trying to create this sort of transnational exchanges to support the mobility, then and of course online is fantastic, but face to face exchange that creative synapsis uh, in person is really uh, critical. So I think those are some of the things that are strongly resonating really encourage further development uh, in this area. And we're also encouraging our members, not only in the Caribbean, but broadly to really look at your guide and see how they can learn also to ensure that the information is being reached and when um, and sort of to expand some of the outreach when it comes to uh, making the information available. I'll stop there maybe, Marie. Thank you um, very much for this clear, clear resume, I would say, of the different points that connect also uh, to your uh, member in relation with different subjects, be it at the level uh, of legal infrastructure, funding, of course, and what you mentioned as well. I think it's in most of the introductory notes of each section, this question of how the climate change also impact very much uh, the region. Um, and in fact, you also lead us to the second part uh, of this panel discussion, the idea in the second part and also to engage uh, uh, with the conversation with, uh, with our audience. I have to say we have more than 100 people that follow us. There were more than 300 people that register or were interested to attend. So there is a true interest. I think it's one of the most uh, popular uh, webinar uh, of uh, On The Move uh, so far. So we will I mean, we were, we were already engaged on the question, but it, it gives us also more connection to, to continue. So this uh, second round of discussion is more to pave the way towards potential solution, ways out, you know, to try to uh, improve the situation in relation with mobility information access, in relation with a stronger a connected relation within the Caribbean region and in connection with other world region, since we have this partnership uh, with uh, the ACP EU programs, we can be also in relation with the EU, but not only, of course. Um, and the question also maybe of um, a particular attention placed on professional development program. We feel as well that of course, there is a scarcity of opportunities, but at the same time that much more people could be empowered to apply or benefit from opportunity if they knew and if some form of accompagnement, as we say in French, so mentoring time of process could be adapted depending on the context. Uh, so I will start again my little round. So here we can be... Um, more uh, focus on maybe, I mean, you can be more, I mean, you were already very focused, we are perfect with time, but maybe with one or two key idea that you would like to share. And of course, uh, for the, the audience, feel free to share your question, your comment in the chat so that after we can have 15 to 20 minutes also like to uh, address them. So Jordi, um, Jordi, I will start uh, again uh, with you. I mean, like for this uh, second round. Um, here again, based on your research, what are 
you know, one or two key ideas that you would like to highlight in order to strengthen mobility opportunities within the region and in connection to it. And maybe here to see more the connection with the European Union for this uh, particular part. Um, Ambassador uh, Betan Nayo rem reminded us in her introduction the importance also of the policy framework that do exist between EU and Caribbean countries. So how we can also take the opportunities of this policy framework to work more on facilitating mobility opportunities. Thank you, Jordi. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, yeah, focusing a bit on let's say the challenges, but also what can be the solutions to to address them. I mean, it's already been said, but there's a there's a first important level which has to do with information and knowledge, and and of course, say a guide like this uh, becomes a tool to address that. But uh, as it's also been said, I mean, sometimes it's not enough for the information to be out there. It's also how you what use you make of that, and let's say how. Uh, let's say there are opportunities to generate, say, uh, an enabling environment for that knowledge to reach those that have the potential and the need to use that. So, and then I think there's the need to think of capacity building processes of, let's say, relaying that information to those on the ground. I mean, one of the apparent difficulties uh, here might be the relative lack of portals or tools which are particularly targeted to the needs existing in the in the region. So that might be something to address. And of course, then there's an, an element of linguistic diversity within the region. And we increasingly have tools that can help to address that. But let's say that's also something to, to navigate. Uh, looking at the, at the broader picture, um, I mean, there's broader uh, challenges that render international mobility difficult for many artists and culture professionals, uh, including in particular those in countries from the from the global south. And, and it's important to remind of the difficulties that many people find in obtaining visas and being able to travel to the to the global north. And in that respect, uh, I mean also looking at that from a European European perspective, uh, it's it's worth uh, reminding of uh, the 2005 Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions and the call it has to provide preferential treatment to cultural professionals and to cultural expressions from uh, developing countries. And there is that that is a clause that is very important and is not always taken into account. It is true, as it's been said, that there's always that tension at the national level between giving priority or giving attention to international exchange or to national development, but there is a need for both and there are international commitments that should imply that countries in Europe should make it easier for artists and cultural professionals from the global south to obtain uh, visas to to access uh, markets in the in the global north and as it has also been said by Magdalena uh, new tools like the fair culture charter that was uh, adopted uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago and which uh, the link uh, has been shared in the, in the chat as well are also initiatives that aim to address these and generate fairer uh, forms of cultural exchange between uh, the global north and the, and the global south uh, more broadly, I mean, there's there's a few elements that have already been mentioned. I mean, the, some of the legal difficulties that make it difficult for certain uh, individuals or organizations to access certain kinds of funding. And I won't go much into detail in that. But then, I mean, I think it's also worth reminding of the importance of cultural policies within, uh, within countries and, and territories to, uh, let's say, consult with the needs of artists and culture professionals and adopt mechanisms and generate uh, enabling environments for civil society organizations and for individuals and, and organizations to be in a better position to take to, to, to take part in international cultural exchange. So, yeah, just a bit generally, but a, a few of the elements that I would share uh, at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jordi. And also, um, thank you very much as well to <laughs> mention this question of visa um, uh, issue um, that come up very often, unfortunately, still in the conversation, particularly um, uh, in relation with a connection from the global south to the global north and in relation here with a Schengen country. Just a note on this side, uh, we published last year 
uh, report on the question of on related to the challenge of uh, African uh, artists and cultural professionals when applying for visa in Schengen country. And this report, we remember with our colleague, was very much shared by colleagues in the Caribbean saying we face also the same kind of issue. We should also work more uh, on this. And uh, yeah, this is also um, a question, of course, that on the movies, some of its members and also many partners are uh, very much working at. Um, Jake, uh, the question is a bit the same, maybe more at the US level also, like what kind of key takeaway recommendation you would have even for your organization in relation with uh, a US uh, stakeholder with whom uh, you uh, work. It can be also private foundation. I mean, private foundation are very uh, powerful uh, in the US. So some key idea that you would like to share in this respect for the next step as well to work on. Yes, of course. Thank you. And I thought it would be maybe enriching to highlight these takeaways through a couple of specific entries we have in the guide, as I think that kind of illustrates the specific uh, steps that could be helpful. Uh, first, one option that I want to highlight, one entry we have in the guide is from the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art that hosts actually a specific Puerto Rico artist fellowship. Um, and while it's not international mobility per se, I think the important thing to note, and even more so perhaps for territories of European nations in the Caribbean, is that getting to the continental, getting to the mainland United States is a burden. It's a financial uh, challenge for artists from Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, programs that have these residencies or cultural exchanges between perhaps a territory and the mainland can be really important ways to do a couple of things. First, obviously, is a cultural exchange between the host community and the artist. Uh, but secondly, I would say it does something that's very important and something we see at Artists at Risk um, that's important for uh, folks who have faced enforced mobility, which is connection from the diaspora community with the artists who are still remaining on the island, which can be really important from a cultural aspect. And then uh, on top of all of that, of course, these kinds of opportunities are elevating within the national context, within the U.S. context, the voices of perhaps underrepresented communities. And I think that can go a much longer way in raising awareness and advocating for more mobility opportunities targeting these populations in particular. Um, another opportunity I wanted to mention was through the National Performance Network, which is a creation and development fund. And the aspect that I found particularly interesting about that was the requirement for artists to apply with co-commissioners, which are other organizations who are essentially saying that they are giving some form of resource, financial capacity wise, to support folks in their project. Uh, organizations like ARC, for example, recently started fellowships, one for uh, writers in exile and is in the second edition of one for Cuban migrant artists. And I think that those types of organizations who are constantly interfacing with artists and at the same time doing awareness raising with larger institutions and funders uh, are uniquely positioned to do this kind of co-collaboration and provide these kind of stabilizing elements around the creative process that allows for a more fluid mobility opportunity and a more enriching uh, exchange that also in some way facilitates professional development. It goes beyond simply creation. Um, and the final one was actually an additional resource we added called the Color Congress, and it's specific to the U.S., but it's a, a membership-based organization that is supporting nonfiction filmmakers and audiences of color in the U.S. and its islands. Um, and I think particularly in the U.S. context, and as the Government Accountability Office itself notes, we have just generally a data deficiency when it comes to understanding the demographics and challenges of U.S. territories and islands. And when you compile that with the fact that uh, in, in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, we're talking about predominantly community of colors who may have been historically disenfranchised, uh, finding ways to support and put our trust and investment in these membership communities or folks who can effectuate collective action in a tangible way amongst organizations that are local, uh, I think is really important. Because when you put that trust and investment in these organizations, you give them that agency and that backing, and that in turn creates infrastructure locally and then gives you medium and long-term sustainability, which is really the key goal. Thank you very much, uh, Jake. And also like to connect some of the, I mean, most Merci of your recommendations. Beaucoup, Jake. 
uh, in relation with uh, with um, uh, some of the example of the mobility funding scheme. I think it's it's uh, it's it's a research on the research which is also uh, uh, very interesting, and it's also a way for me to remind that in this mobility funding scheme uh, that are listed here, so in relation with the Caribbean guide, but it's also the case for other guides. We always add. I mean, and it's not we. It's also the researcher also always added at the end of each section. So either in relation with international funding or in relation with country and territory, additional uh, portal, uh, platform, organization as well, that can be useful for the sector. And we think this, this is something that we were not very much doing at the very beginning, but we think that it's very important as well to highlight such type of resources particularly in contexts where resources are scarce, and also to provide some um, eventually good solution or good case practices. I mean, Jordi was mentioning that it could be interesting, for instance, to have like portal of information, information platform. And sometimes they do exist in some context, but they lack financial support to expand, uh, to expand their database and to expand their connections. So this is also another way to try uh, to, you know, somehow connect the dot in terms of access to information. Now I, I'm turning myself towards uh, Anna Maria. So here the same little exercise, policy recommendation, maybe here more at I would say at the national level for you, so uh, in relation with the Netherlands, and maybe as well in relation with the EU, because for the past year, there have been also from the European Commission different program incentive, be them specific, like the uh, former Archipel program uh, that was a specific project, or also part of Culture Move Europe, which is also open to European overseas territories, country and region. So maybe you have also like two or three key recommendations that you would like to share here uh, in this session. Um, first of all, maybe we can, I will start focusing on uh, the infrastructure. So um, one of the things that I've noticed here is that when we need support from representatives from the island or the government or the Department of Culture, um, sometimes there is a lack of understanding of what that mobility request means or even why an artist would like to be part of a particular residency. And that really affects a lot. Um, I know a few cases where uh, letters have been requested and there has been zero uh, uh, acknowledgement from the, either the Department of Culture or the Ministry of Culture. And it comes a lot uh, with that um, lack or gap of information of why this is important on a national uh, level. And I think that if we talk about uh, the representatives from, from Holland, because in Holland it is so familiar um, they don't have these discussions that often or that's how it what it feels like uh, with the local government. So I think that on that is very important because um, talking again about things such as the Chamber of Commerce or taxes, um, there isn't information for the cultural practitioners or the artists locally. And therefore, they are scared of actually replying to these open calls when they know um, that they can uh, participate. So that on one level. And then on the level of the of the sector itself, of the uh, participants themselves, um, that idea of mentoring or having some kind of guide, um, guiding hand is very helpful, at least at the beginning. I think that it's more um, embedding this uh, culture within our uh, cultural sector, if that makes sense. So to really make it a bit more familiar what an open call is, what artist mobility is. I remember once we did actually with On The Move a little talk about artist mobility on the island and a lot of people did not understand what that meant. And it's a gap for, it was a gap for me because then I realized, oh yes, I actually have to be more explicit about certain terms that for me are very familiar. So that um, is also very helpful. Um, and I think another thing to uh, realize is talking about this broad, the open call for the uh, within the islands. A lot of local artists want to have want to respond to open calls to Europe, and I think it's a missed opportunity because talking again about uh, the ecological impact of traveling within the islands um, and to Europe. 
I think that it's a missed opportunity to uh, not see Latin America as, a, as a, an interesting partner. And also the other islands, a lot of artists, they see those open calls and they're like, well, you know, I would rather go to Holland where I feel like I have an opportunity to have an exhibition. And that is part of this uh, self-education that we have to go through to understand what these uh, opportunities of mobility within the islands and within the region and the continent of uh, America, North, South and Central, what it actually means for your artistic development. So I think that some uh, work should be done on those areas as well. And it's uh, also uh, an exercise and, uh, of understanding what the impact of colonialism is and how it still plays a role within our cultural practice and within ourselves. So I think those would be uh, some of the notes uh, that I have for this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. This is very rich also like to continue to work on this uh, uh, recommendation in relation uh, with the guide and, um, and now I would like to 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 um, ask also uh, Magdalena so here I would like maybe to focus in relation with your next big event uh, the so IFACA is uh, co-organizing with the Arts Council of Korea in May next year the 10th World Art um, uh, and Culture Summit uh, and I was wondering to what extent some of this um, you know some of the thought key takeaway recommendation could help also uh, to contribute uh, to some of the content or panel discussion. I know that the program is now uh, being uh, uh, done, but when I, you know, when you see the title of this uh, World Art Summit, and I know um, uh, that uh, the link is being shared in the, in the, in the chat, that it's the, the title is on charting the future of arts and culture with some topic related to collectivity, connectedness, and participation. I think with one, some of the points that we heard here could be quite interesting food for thought as well to be brought in a meeting uh, like, uh, like the next World uh, Art Summit. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Um, I'll talk uh, briefly about the World Summit and then I wouldn't mind sharing some also ideas and possible recommendations in line with them. Um, what my fellow colleagues uh, here, panelists have already indicated. So yes, our world summits are a very key point in time when we bring together policymakers, uh, thought leaders, cultural, um, uh, you know, key leaders, um, the academic world, researchers, the sector itself. And we're trying increasingly to bring other sectors into this conversation um, and to really have a kind of a global international uh, conversation around the sort of key issues moving forward. We've got some quite major milestones that are coming around soon. We've got the next meeting of the Ministers of Culture of Mondial Court happening in 2025 in Barcelona in September, a key point in time. A few days ago, the UN Summit uh, of the Future was held and they uh, adopted the Pact of the Future and while we wanted more on culture, there are some still important mentions in there. So there's a lot of um, important moments, milestones that are going to be shaping what cultural policy and what our nations are looking at. Um, and then obviously the influence that civil society and you know, the sector can have in that. So for us, the World Summit is a very important point in time to sort of start in that journey of what 2025 looks like. And you said quite well, um, the topics of our World Summit, we know that for the Mondia Kult, it's, for the moment, they're looking at culture for peace and um, artificial intelligence and the digital space. But when we started to think about what sort of future and how we chart the future, we realised that we need a multiplicity of knowledge systems. We needed different, different schools of thought. We needed different narratives. We needed... First Nations narratives, we needed living cultures narratives, we needed community um, voices, we needed um, a diversity of expressions to be helping us navigate these comp complex times. So that's one stream. The second stream, as you said, Marie, is around participatory systems and connectedness. And absolutely, mobility is going to be tackled there. It's very important. How particularly in these very complex time with the geopolitical situation, what, how connected are we? What's happening in terms of the public space? There's a polarization, there is an erosion in the public debate. So 
it's not only the physical mobility, but it's the mobility of, of ideas that exchange that is going to be very critical. So mobility will absolutely also be part of um, that uh, discussion. Um, and the digital systems, obviously, and what uh, artificial intelligence, the pros and the cons that um, are impacting, we see all that together is how we need to come together to look at what the future we want and um, how arts and culture sits within it and how it can really lead. So um, it is an invitation uh, for everybody. You are correct, the call has closed for now, but we really strive to ensure that there are diverse voices. There's generally quite a strong participation of the Global South and we seek investment to make sure that that representation is there. And we also seek voices. We have a particular fo focus on small island states, uh, developing states. We want to make sure that the, the richness of that diversity of perspectives is also present in our dialogue. We all have so much to learn from each other and it's not one direction in that sense at all. Um, so that is an invitation to everybody. And Marie, as you said, that the link has been shared and um, uh, it, it is happening in May of 2025. Just a few key points I wanted to add in terms of those, uh, it's already been touched on to some extent. But I want to emphasize in terms of the governments and any government representatives that are here or any of you that are in dialogue with your local policymakers is to emphasize the importance of bilateral and multilateral exchanges. The more opportunities that in those agreements there can be aspects about people to people exchange, then you have an opportunity to then act, you know, uh, look at framing possible um financing of those exchanges that may or may not sit within the culture portfolio. It could end up sitting in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs portfolio, but do not underestimate those opportunities. Um, more concretely, I also want to flag the Ibero-American programs because I think they're really interesting programs where 22 countries that are Ibero-America, so Spain, Portugal, and Andorra, and then Latin American countries, and many that are quite well resourced and others that are not, they come together and they agree on specific programs and they each contribute what they can to these programs, making it then available for the sector to apply. So I can imagine all of the Caribbean countries coming together, and I know there's CARICOM, but if there were programs that were specifically dedicated to different sectors and it's a small contribution of each country, the, the ripple effect is quite phenomenal. So I, that's a really interesting example. Also, we're talking a lot with our members in the Global North around when we talk about opening up these calls, who are in that evaluation and assessment process? Because if you're getting representatives that are of maybe one particular cultural group or established narrative, and you're inviting the Global South, then you're also getting a disconnect and not quite understanding the diversity of what in some contexts some may consider that isn't hard when in actual it is very much so. So trying to diversify that I think is also going to be a really important thing. And interestingly, a couple of days ago, I was in another conference for Iberia America. It's actually going to be, it was recorded, but launched on for the 14th of October. It is in Spanish. So colleagues, only for those that speak Spanish will be able to hear. But they, the topic was really around financing of culture, but we spoke a lot about small to medium businesses, enterprises, both on the cultural sector, but also on the business side and how they're an untapped potential for collaboration and, and investment and potentially co-investment with particularly countries that are not that have um, developing economies. So I think there's a really important opportunity to start looking at what the business side is in terms of how it can, or the corporate sector, or as I said, particularly that small to medium that can collaborate yeah, in that space. And finally, we're going to be going to Puerto Rico and we're going to be uh, hosting our next Americas chapter, which is all of the Americas, North, Central, Caribbean, and South. And we're going to have it coincide with NASA, which is a national 
art state agencies, I'm just saying it wrong, National Assembly of Art State Agency. So we're also recognizing that we have to be more intentional around how we sort of uh, exchange. But um, huge congratulations on the guide. And I think it's a, it's an important um, part of this information building that uh, we all need to be part of and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for also, I mean, there are so many uh, ideas also like to in unpack. This is uh, really uh, interesting. I just would like also to pick up on, on your uh, last comment on this question on related to a small or medium enterprise and to tap uh, to go into untapped potential for co-investment. Uh, I think some of our colleagues also part of uh, On The Move, uh, I'm thinking uh, particularly of Culture Funding Watch, for instance, more focusing on the African continent and uh, the MENA region and uh, director and founder is Wafa Belgasem. They are also very much working on this particular area, more in connection with the global source as well. So this is very interesting as well to, to hear about uh, such type of conversation um, in the context you, you just mentioned. Um, so now we, we have a little bit of time. So this was so rich that, uh, we, but we still have uh, 10 good minutes um, for people uh, who want to, um, to ask uh, some question. For the moment in, in the chat, it's more a question more of confirmation. So for instance, uh, as far as um, mobility, uh, whether this guide is focusing only on the Caribbean, yes, indeed, in connection with the Caribbean region, but after on our webpage, there are other mobility funding guides. Uh, there is uh, an interesting um, comment, uh, if I may write also uh, from uh, Donna Green uh, Rosnigi, sorry for the pronunciation. Um, and this is mentioned as policymaker, we strongly support bilateral and multilateral cooperation. For the SIDS, this is essential, the main prohibitive factor is the cost of travel. And for changing my, my, mindset to move beyond seeing travel as a luxury to understand that it is a necessity. And uh, yeah, this is something as well that not only in relation with the Caribbean region, um, but in general uh, on which we work, this question of the motivation uh, behind mobility and why we are in mobility and the question of uh, being a, a choice or not a choice. Um, and um, is there any maybe um oh yeah there was a, a question uh which is um um uh, from uh front ibius um in a way uh, magdalena you replied to it but maybe if you want to be more specific how to participate in the world summit on arts and culture i think it uh, draws also a lot of attention and the idea here was also to see how we can connect also between the world region and an international uh, setting. So how to participate? If you are an individual, can you uh, participate as, as an individual member since it's more related to uh, Art Council and Cultural Agency? Uh, Magdalena, if you wish to, to add. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, our World Summit are absolutely open to everybody. And um, I, I, know I, I, I say that being very cognizant and aware that there's a financial Im implication to travel to Seoul. So I, I, I don't want to um, <laughs> underestimate that. And regrettably, we don't have the finances to be uh, supporting um, people to travel to Seoul beyond our speaker program, which um, that call has now closed. Um, it was opened back in July, from May to July. Um, but yes, it is... Uh, our World Summits are highly participatory. We use a model to ensure that um, quite often we say that the experts aren't necessarily the ones on stage, it's everybody. And so the formats we use are quite participatory. We have something called a World Cafe session on our first day where everybody has an opportunity to collaborate and co-create. So, and there are lots of opportunities for also for everybody to um uh, spend three days engaging with policymakers, directors of arts councils, um, uh, people on the 
uh, from UNESCO and uh, other international agencies and networks and and colleagues from around the world. So you're absolutely welcome. We have um, different registration fees and that apply obviously for those in developing countries and also if you're an independent and an artist. Um, and uh, if you go to your country or uh, maybe through the mobility fund guide, there may be some opportunities to um, seek support depending on your country, but we would welcome uh, you all. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Maybe another question to you, a quick one from uh, Celia Fisher that I think you know. Uh, she's an uh, executive director, secretary general of the International Music Council. Um, Magdalena, do you think that a program such as Iber Musicas or other could be agreed upon also among Caribbean government? 100%. 100%. I think it is a model that is adapted and contextualized to the countries that are part of it, because it's the countries themselves that make the decision on what, what is involved and how it is defined. So I think that it is about, um, in the context of the Ibero-American space, it's the heads of states that make these agreements. So the Caribbean countries come together and they say, we would like to, they, they have a secretariat and I might be getting my governance confused, but I would imagine that CARICOM might be the closest thing to that. So if CARICOM, the ministers of culture would agree on, and it's a matter of them coming together, they set up the parameters of what that criteria would look like, um, depending on the amount of countries, um, then, uh, uh, based on that, um, they may decide that they need a minimum of 50% of the countries to be part of it. This is a criteria that, as I said, is contextual. And then how each contribute, again, is according to their capability, uh, their, their ability. But I think the, the principle of it is that the members, those countries within the region, come together and say, this is important, and then define programs that are going to be specific and relevant to their communities. And so then they have a rotation in terms of who looks after the present or the coordination so that there is an opportunity that that, that sort of, um, yeah, rotates um, maybe annually. But, um, and then the funds, it kind of feeds directly into the sector, but it's a larger pool. So I think it's completely, absolutely um, applicable as long as it's contextualized within the priorities and the and the, the the what makes sense within the Caribbean context. Thank you uh, very much for this very detailed uh, answer. Um, in fact, now we have much more comment and question, which is great. Uh, some of them are uh, directly uh, answered by um, uh, by our uh, panelists. Uh, thank you, Jordi, for that on, on the list of countries in relation with the country that are uh, listed in this guide um, in relation with the Caribbean region. Maybe there is a question from Paz Bege. Uh, hello, Paz. It has been quite some time. Um, and um, this question is uh, targeting Ana Maria, so I am just just reading it, uh, regarding what Anna Maria is saying about going on tour to Europe or working within Latin America and Central America, I think often the festival program condition budget-wise in Europe can make a difference for the artist. Yeah. So if you want to, to comment on this, thank you. For sure. No, that is also another uh, reason, if I understood the comment correctly, that of course, as a cultural practitioner, you would like to participate uh, in an initiative that has the budget or a budget uh, that helps you execute it. But I, in the conversations that I've had, the idea of opportunities uh, being more valuable in Europe or in the States does come up. So um, it is one of the, I think, reasons that these hesitation comes up uh, to travel somewhere else or within the islands themselves. Um, so I think that it's like a, a multiple um, approach, right? To also start to think about op what opportunities can look like without only focusing on this ideal that we have of, of Europe, I think. 
thank you uh, very much for for your answer. I am also uh, noticing um, um, and and pass. Uh, thank you. Um, I am also noticing a, a comment by uh, Kim Marie Spencer, uh, who is originally from Jamaica, is a, a, a lecturer professor in Belfast, and that we had the great pleasure to have to have at our uh, last forum in Carnarvon. And she mentioned that, yeah, great job on the move. So it's partly the work of the researchers. So thanks again very much to the team of researchers. So overdue and a great resource. I wonder if the process of research had impacted cultural policy and discussion for countries with non-contiguous territories or colonies. If not, if there is a discussion program to pursue this from international our local Caribbean partner, Caribbean between uh, being uh, written into brackets. So I, I guess this one is 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 um, is a, is, a, is more a comment or uh, also part of a recommendation. But if somebody wants to comment on that, uh, I would say as a as a last uh, comment. But for me, I, I take it more as a takeaway to to work forward on on this question. But maybe one of you want to to have a last comment on this. Yeah, maybe if I if I may, I mean, on the one hand, it, it's worth mentioning that the the methodology for the production of this guide is is mainly desk based, and that one of the things we particularly emphasize is that the schemes and the opportunities that are included in the in the guide uh, should be easily accessible online rather than being things that you particularly uh, need to ask for by uh, other ways so uh, so so there is a focus on on information that is available and that you can find uh, uh, online in any case having said this uh, i mean i think some of the some of the researchers involved in the in the team did consult with several stakeholders and i think particularly when you look at the at the guide you'll see for instance in the case of in the case of judith uh, that focused on Dutch speaking territories. I mean, there's, there was quite a lot of consultation in that process, and I'm sure I mean, several others, other people uh, did as well. So there is a component of awareness raising. There is a component of, let's say, putting that on the table as an important issue. And But but I think more importantly, hopefully, with the publication of this guide and with this uh, webinar and so on, I mean, there is that is part of a process to put this uh, as a priority. And hopefully, uh, I mean, Little by little, that can that can have an impact in terms of of improving policies, and complementing this kind of this kind of tools with other measures like the ones we've been discussing, Edwin. Thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for this last comment, Jordi. Thank you very much uh, for the four of you. Uh, it was a very, very rich uh, conversation. Jordi, Jake, Magdalena, and Amar Anna Maria, for sure. We uh, keep in touch. Also, like to work on the follow up of this uh, guide, of this uh, discussion. So, thanks uh, very much uh, for your time and your generosity as well in sharing feedback, information, and of course, base for. Jordi and Jake uh, on your research. Uh, I would like to thank once again very much Ambassador uh, Mrs. Simone Beton Nayo and Miss Annika Florent for their intervention at the beginning because I, I, I um, it it helped also like to uh, contextualize uh, the reason why we were all gathered also uh, today. Thanks again for our researcher for the guide. Uh, so beyond the team of On The Move is Johan Flock and Katie Kerigi Watts, uh, Rose Baylor, Pascal Jomé, Judith Van Den Kooy, Jake, uh, Jordi, uh, Stephanie Thomas Gilbert Robert, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot also to our uh, colleague from the National Captioning Institute. There are so many between the French, the, no, the English and the Spanish that I, I didn't get the name, but thanks for your help. I hope this help as well, like to uh, also navigate the different accents while uh, uh, talking uh, into English. In particular, I am speaking for myself. Uh, and uh, Mariam, uh, Shaib, uh, Babu and Belen Simaro for the interpretation in Spanish uh, and English. Thanks to our supporter, the European Union, whole round for the web streaming, the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, the ACP EU uh, program and particularly Aya Kasasa, uh, Artists at Risk uh, and Dutch Culture. For the next step, uh, I'm quite sure that uh, my colleague uh, Bernardo already shared a small uh, evaluation form that you can fill 
also to have any feedback. You can leave also your email if you need to be con con contacted, uh, if you have any particular question. Uh, we don't, I saw this question, so I am addressing it uh, now. We don't provide specific mentoring program in relation to the guide, but we can reply to question on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, what we aim to do as well in a, a middle and long-term perspective is definitely to bring all these recommendation idea more at a, in a policy recommendation paper or within the scope of upcoming uh, meeting and conference. And what I would like also to stress, and I guess if you have followed this uh, webinar, the idea that is that this guide is, of course, not a standalone document. It will be followed by other mobility funding guides, other type of collaboration. And uh, we will, of course, continue as we have done it in the past to try as much as possible to invite also professional artists from the Caribbean region in our different activities, including our upcoming forum. So thanks a lot and have a good rest of the day or of the night, depending of wherever you are based uh, in the world. Thank you.